So this morning we're going to look at Romans chapter 5, uh, verses 12 through 21. That's going to be our focal passage. Um, I guess you could say that's going to be our foundation passage. I'm really not even going to stay in that, but just long enough to read it. Um, and then we're going to look at the book of Genesis and a couple of uh, passages in the four Gospels. Um, so probably what we'll do is, what you may want to do is just jot down scripture references. Um, don't try to flip back and forth a whole lot. Um, and then just go back when you get home and, and read through the passages that, that I'm going through. Um, I always say, you know, trust me when I'm preaching, but verify later and make sure I preach the right thing. And, uh, you know, so, so go back. I always go back and reread the scripture that I read, you know, because you know, sometimes you may look at something and go, I didn't get quite get what he said out of that. Um, you know, and that's part of that is, you know, I, I'll, I'll look at something and get an idea. And sometimes you may look at it and get a different idea. And it's just that God's speaking to us differently through the passage of scripture. Uh, but th this is one that um, I started to do as a, as a two or three part series. And I just wasn't comfortable with, what, with how the first sermon would end if I did it as a multiple part series. So I, I just combined it into one big sermon. And, uh, and so, but, it, but it's one that, I don't know, just kind of struck me. Uh, it's one that's kind of kind of been mulling over in my head for the for really a couple of months now, um, and uh, and so I've been kind of wanting to, to get into this get into this study get into this sermon. Uh, it's not going to be any Greek or Hebrew or anything like that to, to have to deal with this morning. Um, although that is one of the fun parts to me. For me, that's one of the fun parts about preparing a message. Uh, but let's look at Romans chapter twelve. I mean, sorry, Romans chapter five, starting in verse twelve. And it says, Therefore, just as though one man's sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. For until, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who was a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand the judgment arose from, from one transgression revol resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who received the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification to life of all men. For as through the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. The law came in so that the transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that, as sin reigned in death, even so, grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you for... For your word we thank you for for the the message that you give us through your text and god as we as we look into this text we look into your word god ask you to just speak to us speak to us in a way that only you can Re reveal your word to us in such a way that that it moves us it changes us and god that we would take that word with us throughout the rest of the week apply it to our lives and even then, share it with those around us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, what I want to talk to you about this morning is two gardens. This is a tale of two gardens. The Garden of Eden and the Garden of Gethsemane. 
See, in the Garden of Eden, you have Adam, which is, as Paul is talking about, the one who created the fall of humanity, who brought sin into the world. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, you have Jesus Christ, who by his decisions to obey God brought redemption to the world. So let's look and let's discuss first at, at Genesis chapter 2. You have, you have Adam, and it says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Simple rule, right? You can do anything you want, but that. Anything, you can eat from any tree you want to eat. You can eat anything in this garden you want to eat. Don't touch that tree. I know it always seems like a simple rule when you're a parent. You look at a child and you go, you can do anything you want to, but that. And lo and behold, time goes by, that's the one thing they most want to do. And so here you have Adam. He's been told this one rule. And Adam ends up exiting the Garden of Eden, giving man the need for laws. Because he couldn't follow one rule, we now have commandments that we have to follow. It was because of Adam that we needed the Ten Commandments. Because Adam couldn't follow that one simple rule of don't eat from that one tree. And then you have Christ. Christ enters the Garden of Gethsemane having fulfilled the laws. Back to you in Matthew 5, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, it says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. This is Jesus talking. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. See, when Jesus walked into the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he was crucified, he walked into the Garden of Gethsemane as a human, as a man who had followed every law, obeyed every law. He lived a perfect life. And there wasn't a single rule, there was not a single law that he had broken. See, what Christ was saying here in Matthew chapter 5 was foretelling what he was going to be doing when he walked into the Garden of Gethsemane. And that is a fulfillment of the law. He said, I came not to abolish the law. I didn't come to get rid of the law. I came to fulfill the law. See, Christ lived a perfect life. He faced all of our temptations in the wilderness. When he went into the wilderness, he faced every one of our temptations. He displayed his knowledge of the laws and the religious rituals to the Pharisees and Sadducees. They were challenging him on a regular basis. Every time he turned around, there was a Pharisee or a Sadducee or some legal or religious expert who was challenging his authority. And he frequently had his authority questioned. Even those who were not religious leaders were challenging his authority. When Jesus entered the Garden of Gethsemane, he had fulfilled all the rules and all the laws that had been placed before him. Adam. Adam ate the fruit of sin. In Genesis 3, 6 says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Sin became too irresistible for mankind. You know, I like the Facebook meme that shows Eve eating from the fruit. It says, This is the only time in history that the woman's ever decided what to eat or where to eat. And this is why we can't get them to pick restaurants anymore. 
but sin became too irresistible. Have you ever heard the phrase ugly as sin? You ever heard that phrase ugly as sin? Yeah. I'm sorry, but that's one of the dumbest phrases on the planet. Because if sin was ugly, we wouldn't be tempted by it. Sin is actually quite beautiful, quite enticing. If you'll notice in the story of Adam and Eve, as I read, the fruit was pleasant to the sight. Sin was pleasant to the sight. Sin looked good. It was pretty fruit. That's how Satan got Eve to eat it. Look, Eve, how pretty that fruit is. Can you believe God's telling you not to eat that fruit and how pretty it is? Why would God make fruit so pretty and not let you eat it? You just hear those words coming out. Isn't that how Satan gets us with sin? Look how nice it is. Look, look how, man, that's going to feel good when you do that sin. You're going to enjoy that sin. Look how pretty that sin is. That food you're not supposed to eat, how good it tastes. Yeah, y'all. Y'all saw my Facebook. Some of y'all saw my Facebook post yesterday. Y'all. Y'all know what I'm talking about. That food looked good. Now, I was regretting it later, but that food looked good. And it was pleasant. And it was delicious. And I didn't eat the rest of the day because I was, I was stuck. But that was good food. That big old hunk of cake that's sitting on the counter at the restaurant, it looks good. It's sinful to eat, but it looks good. But that's how Satan gets us. So uh, to me, the word ugly of sin has always been a, a funny phrase to use because really sin's beautiful. Christ, on the other hand, you know, Adam, Adam ate the fruit of sin. Christ drank the cup of redemption. Luke 22, verses 41 and 42, it says this, And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. See, Christ went into the Garden of Gethsemane knowing he had a cup to drink from. And the, cup, the cup was his sacrifice. The cup was his torturous death and crucifixion. And what his words were was, Father, I don't want to drink this cup, but if that's what has to happen, I'll drink it. So see, Adam drink, Adam ate the fruit that he didn't need to eat, but he wanted it. Christ drank from the cup he didn't want to drink from, but we needed it. <coughs> Genesis chapter 3 verse 21 says this, the Lord God, excuse me, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. See, when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, they realized that they were naked. And so they hid themselves and they covered themselves. And God comes along and he says, "What are you doing?" And they said, "Well, God, we're naked." See, Adam and Eve God clothed Adam was clothed by God to cover him up for his sins. When Adam and Eve sinned, their sin created for them a sense of embarrassment over not being clothed. Now, their embarrassment was a physical embarrassment. They realized that they were physically naked and they were embarrassed. When we sin, we have a sense of embarrassment. Because our spiritual nakedness is revealed to us. When we sin, we are spiritually, we, we, essentially we spiritually unclothe ourselves before God. And we reveal ourselves as imperfect. We reveal ourselves to God as unpleasant. And that should cause us a humiliation. That should cause us an embarrassment. If we're not embarrassed about our sins, then something's wrong. You know, as, as I heard a preacher say one time, being a Christian is not whether or not you sin, it's whether or not you feel conviction over your sins. 
if we don't feel conviction and embarrassment over our sins, then that's when you just need to start wondering whether or not you're actually a Christian. If you can sin and not feel embarrassed about it, there's something spiritually wrong deeper down in there. And it goes beyond your sin. Christ, on the other hand, was stripped by man as he covered our sins. John 19, 23 through 24 says this. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part for a part to every soldier, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So they stripped Jesus physically stripped Jesus of all of his clothes as he hung on the cross dying for our sins so when Jesus took his took our sins to the cross with him he experienced the human embarrassment of nakedness that first struck mankind after his first sin notice the parallel there Adam realized he was naked only after he sinned and when Jesus went to the cross for our sins, he became naked. However, the physical embarrassment of being naked will never equal the spiritual humiliation that Christ experienced having our sins exposed before a sinless Savior. Remember, once God clothes himself in our sins, that's when you have that prayer where God said, where Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you turned your back on me? Because God couldn't look at his son anymore. He was covered in our sin. That was the embarrassment, the humiliation that Christ experienced for us was when he clothed himself in our sin to the point that his own father couldn't look at him. In Genesis 3.22, you have this. It says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. See, when Adam ate from the tree of knowledge, he exposed himself to sin. However, there was a second tree called the tree of life. So what happened? What happened to the tree of life? Hidden. God saved that for Christ. See, Adam ate from the tree of knowledge. Christ was crucified on the tree of life. Because when Christ was crucified on that cross, on that wooden cross, he brought eternal life for the ability to have eternal life, the option to choose eternal life for all mankind. See, when Adam ate from the tree of knowledge, God said we can't have a sinful man with the ability to live forever. But then when Christ was crucified, he provided the ability to for all mankind to live forever under the under the condition that you accept his righteousness and his sacrifice to get that eternal life. Chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3, verses 23 through 24 says this. It says, therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. See, Adam, when he sinned, when he disobeyed God, he broke our communication with God. See, if you're reading in the Genesis story, you'll see that, that God used to come to Adam in the cool of the day 
and commune with him and talk with him and walk with him. And when Adam disobeyed God, he broke that communication. He severed that moment or those moments of being able to, to commune with God and, and to talk and, and walk directly with God. Christ, however, restored our communication. In, in John chapter 17, verses 20, verses 20 and 21, this is just a small, small segment of a prayer that, of the prayer that Jesus prayed. It says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word. That's including us who read the gospel. That they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. What Christ is praying right here is that for that restoration of communication with God to happen through him. What he's saying here is, is my prayer is not only for these disciples who are with me, but for everyone who believes their word and believes that I'm the Messiah and believes that I'm the Savior can have that direct communication and be part of us just like we're part of each other. See, part of Christ's final prayer was for that direct interaction to be restored. During Christ's prayer, he called for God to restore that relationship that allowed for direct communication between mankind and God. And I want you to understand this too. I want you to catch this part. Matthew 27, verses 15 and 51. This is, this is the crucifixion. This is the end of the crucifixion. It says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. See, that veil of the temple was so that we couldn't enter into the presence of God unless we were the high priest. Only the high priest could enter into the presence of God. So what you had to do is you had to bring all of your sacrifices, all of your repentances, essentially your messages to God, give them to the high priest. The high priest goes behind the veil does your sacrifices, prays your prayers for you, and, and has a conversation with God for you, and then he comes back out and he tells you what God wants you to hear. Or at least he tells you what he wants you to hear from God. And when Christ crucified, when Christ gives up his spirit, that veil is torn. So in Christ's prayer, he says, God restore that communication between us and mankind, between you and mankind, when he dies, he removes that obstacle, that veil that is preventing us from having that direct communication. We no longer need someone to speak to God on our behalf. Everything that Adam messed up between us and God in the Garden of Eden, Christ restored in the Garden of Gethsemane. So here's the question I have. And actually it's going to be a series of questions. Which garden are you living from? Are you living a life focused on the laws you can't follow? It's the Garden of Eden life. That one rule you can't seem to quit breaking. Is that where you're living right now? Or are you living a life focused on the grace and the love of the one who fulfilled those laws? The Garden of Gethsemane life. That life where Christ says, let me be the fulfillment of the law for you. Are you eating the fruit of sin? Or are you drinking from the cup of Christ's redemption? See, when Christ gave the Last Supper, he said, Take, drink, this is my blood. And then when he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, I have a cup that I have to drink. I don't want to drink it. But that's what it takes to restore mankind 
to this proper relationship with God, I'll drink it. It's the Garden of Gethsemane law. The drinking Christ's cup of redemption. Are you worried about covering up your sins with physical things? Like Adam and Eve did when they sinned? Or are you allowing to Christ to take on your nakedness as he clothes you in righteousness? The Garden of Gethsemane. A crucifixion. Are you focused on eating from the trees that provide fruits of worldly knowledge? Or are you partaking of the tree of eternal life that can only be provided by crucifying yourself on the cross with Christ? Are you only talking with God when it's cool and pleasant? That Garden of Eden God comes to Adam in the cool of the day when it's nice and pleasant there's a cool breeze blowing and everything's hunky-dory. Is that when you're talking to God? Or are you remaining in constant communication allowing God to speak through you even in those moments in the Garden of Gethsemane when the cup is hard to drink when the drink is bitter but you know it's necessary To the Garden of Eden is where man walked away from a relationship with God. Man was given the option. Have a relationship with God or eat of the forbidden fruit. The Garden of Gethsemane is where Christ restored our relationship with God. So as I close, I want you to think about that. Which garden is your life based on? The one that destroys your relationship with God? Or the more difficult one is the one that restores your relationship with God? Let's pray. Father God, I, I, I come to you with a humble, broken heart. Because there's times I want to dwell in the Garden of Eden. I want that I want that pleasant, cool of the day. I want that forbidden fruit. Even though I know it destroys my relationship with you. And God, there's times that that Garden of Gethsemane lifestyle is a cup I'm not willing to drink. But when I realize that it restores and when I realize that it, that it creates that communication that I most desperately need with you, that's when I finally become willing to drink of that cup. God, I ask that you would just help us to always choose the lifestyle and the life that brings us, can, bring us, bring, brings us closer to you. Even if it involves sacrifices beyond what we think we can, we can give. God, nothing is worth more than our relationship with you. And God, God, help us to always choose that. Regardless of the sacrifice, regardless of of the discomfort that it causes, that we always choose you, that we're willing to crucify our sinful nature, that we're willing to, to leave the Garden of Eden behind and choose the Garden of Gethsemane lifestyle. In Jesus' name.